my name is Michael Ranney, and I'm a professor here at the University of California at Berkeley. And I tend to do research on things that uh, basically are at the intersection of three different realms. One realm is science cognition. The other one is about mathematical cognition, particularly numeracy. And finally, I'm also interested in things that are really important to people and society. And if you look at the triple intersection point between those three realms, climate cognition, which is what I'm most interested in right now, is right at the, at, right at the center of them. Now I think that science denialism in general is really quite rare <laughs> because most people will uh, you know, accept that cell phones work uh, and won't deny it as a tool of the devil or <laughs> something that just isn't functional. You can actually see you know, the scientific principles implemented in a lot of our technology that we use. So maybe the Amish might be <laughs> as close as you get to science deniers in a practical way why people deny certain pockets of science, like evolution and global warming. And to my mind, I think it's because it <coughs> violates um, some of our cultural sort of elements. So I think that part of the, the cultural cognition uh, perspective is appropriate. Um, so I have this model that uh, it's called the Reinforced Theistic Manifest Destiny that uh, <coughs> purports to explain uh, why it is that Americans are different, or why you get a sort of clustering of acceptance in the concepts that relate to religiosity and nationalism on one side, and then sort of global warming and uh, um, evolution on the other. So I think why people uh, deny science in general is often very particular. In the United States, we have this uh, phrase, all politics is local. And I think that's relatively true. That is that the reasons that people deny evolution are correlated with the reasons that people b deny global warming, but they're not perfectly congruent. Uh, and you might even uh, see some religiosity involved in this. So for instance, if you really uh, denied uh, evolution, you could do that from the sense of, of accepting Genesis relatively verbatim. But also, there are religious reasons why you might not accept global warming, because if you really believed in a God of miracles, like how hard would it be for a uh, heavenly uh, uh, entity to just take all the greenhouse gases and throw them into the sun. I mean, if, uh, if uh, uh, an entity could generate the entire universe, how hard would it be for that entity to fix global warming? Or you might also think that a benevolent deity wouldn't allow us to burn ourselves up. And so you get sort of a religious element there. In fact, there are even some very uh, small fringe groups that are anticipating with gusto uh, global warming, because they're thinking this is one of the uh, uh, harbingers of the rapture, one of the horsemen of the apocalypse, you know, like, bring it on! If global warming is great, that means, you know, that the Maasai is coming back. So, I think that there are lots of reasons. Uh, some of it is fear, you know, like, with respect to global warming, one of the things that I point out is it's a very scary thing. In fact, I prefer that global warming would not be true. Uh, in fact, you know, sort of in contrast to a lot of the things that the deniers suggest, I would be so happy. I, I actually put this into my talks now. I have a pledge that if someone could actually convince me that global warming were not true, I would rent the largest SUV I could find. I would drive it to where that person was, kiss them on the mouth or whatever body part they want, and I would stop doing work on global warming entirely, and I would give back any dollar I ever got in funding related to uh, climate change because I don't want it to be true. I would be so happy. The other thing that I should point out, and I realize this is a roundabout answer to your question, is that the people who suggest that, as, as we pointed out earlier, that scientists are just accepting global warming because they're on the dole, that they want the, this money that comes with global warming funding, whether it's from our National Science Foundation or from other, uh, other nations, that is like so wrong. That is just not how science works. I mean, <laughs> if I thought that I could disconfirm global warming, I would do it and I would anticipate being the most famous scientist who ever lived. I mean, imagine if you could deny, if you could point out that global warming was a myth, not only would you know, the fossil fuel companies love you and lavish you with prizes and you'd probably win a Nobel Prize for, for physics or whatever the, the, uh, the relevant degree would be, uh, but you could go into any bar in the world and they say, you're the guy that, that made it so that I didn't have to th you know, drive my SUV into the river. Come here, I'll give you a pint. I mean, you would be so famous. And that is what real scientists look for. They want to overturn paradigms and gain great fame. 
So, you know, I believe it was Australian uh, researchers who found out that ulcers are primarily caused by bacteria and not by stress, as was previously thought, right? I mean, they're terribly famous and celebrated, right? Because they overturned the paradigm, you know, they, 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 uh, they showed the truth. And so it is completely uh, incorrect to think that climate scientists would really rather global warming be true. I mean, maybe in like, you know, a little email or something like that, but in big picture, no, no one wants it. I mean, any, any parent wouldn't want it to be true, right? So if you think about like uh, distaste for global warming, they can be something as simple as like inconvenience, you know, that Al Gore sort of pointed out. Like, uh, I don't want to trade in my vehicle and have to get a plug-in. Or I don't want to change my voltage, you know, from AC to DC. Or I don't want to put solar panels on my house. It's sort of a pain. Or they can be more deeply fear-based, you know, with respect to, uh, you know, what might happen to your children. So I have a friend, a, a dear friend of mine, who accepts that global warming is happening. But, you know, I mean, he said, you know, my fear is that it's too late and we're screwed, you know. And as a father of three, he said, you know, that's really disturbing for me. And so, I mean, I see that as like energizing. It's like, well, that's why I'm in this game. I want to retard global warming because I don't want bad things to happen. But I think some people can, you know, there's a proverb uh, that ostriches don't do this, but the notion of putting your, your head in the sand is, is part of it. So, and also, you know, like, well, what will happen in our economy if we don't have growth in the way we're used to it? Um, what are we going to do with our dollars if we are afraid of, uh, you know, rebound effects. I mean, how can we actually invest? What's going to happen to my pension if, you know, my pension plan is anticipating that it'll get like 6% per year and that's what's going to keep me alive in my old age? What happens if, if we can't do that? And so I think there are a lot of fears that uh, deal with, you know, your own, one's own health, you know, which I think Ed Maybach points out, uh, being oriented toward that. Um, convenience and, uh, and, uh, you know, even in sometimes existential things, like, you know, what would it mean for us to do this? You know, where is our creator if we could actually, you know, like be destroying our species or reducing our numbers so dramatically? So I think that there are a number of dimensions, maybe two or three. I mean, psychologists usually find that you can, that uh, any field comes down to two and a half dimensions <laughs> on average, uh, like emotions and so forth. So I imagine there's something like two and a half different dimensions that accounts for uh, denial, and some of them might probably correlate with uh, fear, and some of them might correlate with inconvenience. So I think part of it is that, especially in the digital age, people are able to sequester their information gathering to a relatively small number of channels. And I think there, there is evidence for this that uh, People who like watch Fox News are less likely to even sample uh, m uh, media outlets that are uh, more liberal in character. And you know, I mean, it used to be in the United States, you had like three networks. You were going to watch ABC, CBS, or NBC. <clears throat> they were all basically the same, same thing. They were all basically normative with respect to science. Well, now you can go on the internet and you can. Uh, find people who might believe the most bizarre thing, that certain ethnic groups are terrible or fantastic, or that certain genders are terrible or fantastic. Um, you, you know, there are all manner of ways in which you can find really peculiar notions, including this idea that, you know, we want global warming to be true so that, you know, rapture uh, envelopes us and this, the, uh, the most noble of us will arise into heaven. So I think part of the difference is that this fragmentation uh, oddly, uh, you know, which came out of, you know, the internet age, which, you know, in which we had these grand dreams of wonderful information being passed around and everyone would be articulate, actually means that you can find your own bin of ignorance. <laughs> and so I think that's part of the difficulty. Um, and my hope is that uh, uh, that will, you know, not last too much longer for climate change. I mean, we don't see it so much in others in which there are many websites that suggest that smoking tobacco is benign or, you know, there hasn't been much inroad into the idea that the earth, you know, might be, you know, plainer. So I'm hoping that eventually uh, we'll find that fewer and fewer of these sites and outlets will be, uh, 
will be denying climate change. And I think the evidence will mount up so quickly that they won't be able to continue that. My fear is that uh, by the time that evidence is so salient that we could have done a lot more than we, than we have done. And so we'll have lost some opportunities for easy fixes for global warming. And we'll have to take a little bit more of the draconian or more difficult fixes. So for instance, one of the ways one can protect yourself is by trying to disconfirm hypotheses. So what we often find is like in numerically driven inferencing that people often know things, uh, but they don't uh, know them coherently enough. So it actually uh, rarely, even on Berkeley's campus with really bright undergraduates, if you ask people what they think the population of the United States is, there'll be one person who'll write down 100,000, and which sounds bizarre. But if you get that person in a room and you say, okay, so there are 100,000 people on Earth, and how many people you think are in LA? And he'll say, well, I'm from LA, there are about 10 million. And I say, okay, so there are 10 million in LA, but only 100,000 on Earth. And then they're going, oh, oh yeah, that can't be true. And so if you get people to sort of try to disconfirm their hypotheses to, uh, for instance, one of the techniques we use with our journalists is we had them, when they ever, they estimated a number, try to imagine a friend of theirs who might estimate the number much higher and why that might be the case, or another friend who might estimate the number be much lower and why that might be the case. And so it turns out that in my work in science cognition in general, there are many times in which people have conflicting uh, beliefs at the same time, these sort of like memes that don't coordinate, and uh, it's only when you point out that there's a conflict that they realize that. So for instance, some people know things about playground swings that are actually in conflict with their understanding of pendulums. Well, they're really the same physical phenomenon. And so when you point out, say, oh, you said this about the playground swing, but how does that work in the pendulum? And they go, oh yeah, that, that can't be the case. And then they have to sort of reconcile it. The other thing I think is quite useful is reasoning to the extreme. Like think, well, you know, were that the case, you know, what if this were 100% or 0%? And often reasoning to the extreme allows one to realize that, uh, that you've made an incorrect assumption somewhere along the way so that you can kind of uh, show that you've generated an absurd con conclusion. So I think really the kind of critical reasoning skills that you'd find in a good uh, textbook about judgment decision making or problem solving are ones that people can employ. The problem is we only have so much time in our lives and so one thing I've written about is that uh, we don't have the time or the processing power to be perfectly uh, coherent. So if I told you my mother's maiden name, you could actually spend you know, a long time trying to compare that bit of information with everything else you know, like whether or not you should move your car or <laughs> whether or not you should buy IBM or something like that. But in fact, you know, uh, it's probably a better use of your time than say, oh, that's nice to know and move on because otherwise you'd never get out of bed in the morning. So we have to sort of pick our battles about which are the things that are worth us spending our precious you know, processing on, you know, our sort of type 2 cognition and, uh, and, and, uh, and our non-heuristic sort of cognition to, uh, to, to work on this problem. And I think global warming is so important that that's one that everyone should be spending their, uh, their precious cognition on. You have to identify the particular places <coughs> where uh, there is a point of conflict. And this is often difficult. Um, so for instance, um, I've interviewed a number of people who accept global warming perfectly fine and yet didn't know the mechanism. In fact, there's a, some studies indicate that people who uh, teach global warming to undergraduates barely have a better model of global warming than the undergraduates they're teaching. So one of the concepts that I point out to people uh, is, that's problematic is there's this particular misconception that uh, sunlight comes in and it goes through the greenhouse gases and then bounces off the earth and then gets trapped by the greenhouse gases. And I say, well, why does it have to go through? Why doesn't it just get trapped on the way in? Uh, how does a greenhouse gas molecule know which way is up or down? And at this point, even some people who've published on global warming go, huh, wow, that is a good question. And so what they're missing there is this notion that light is being transformed, as I said in the 35 words, from visible light to infrared light. In fact, one of the ways I try to reify this for people is I'll say, of every 10 photons that get shot off the asphalt, you know, on a hot summer day, 
toward outer space, only one of them actually reaches outer space. Nine out of ten of them actually get captured uh, by greenhouse gas and, and recycled in the, in the, uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, we actually have little cards that we're now, we've now generated with uh, the mechanism concentrated down to 35 words. Now, we haven't actually, you know, assessed whether or not 35 words is enough to uh, change people's minds, but certainly the 400 words uh, is, and we've replicated this several times with a number of different uh, samples. And uh, so we think it's pretty practical. For instance, it only takes a person maybe two or three minutes to read our 400 words, you know, with uh, relatively, uh, you know, good amounts of comprehension going on. So we think that it's pretty repli replicable and on our website, howglobalwarmingworks.org, even though we really haven't had much chance to promote it, we've had about 140,000 uh, page views uh, looking at our website and our videos. And when you look at what other people have written about it, I mean, some of the pieces that have been written about our stuff, uh, and it's just solely about our work, it uh, gets 100,000 page views. So I calculate that maybe close to a million people have looked at our information involving the statistics are probably more particularly the mechanism. Yeah, and, and we also have five different lengths of video. So if people don't have the time to spend five minutes looking at our uh, longest video, you know, which you might send to say a middle school teacher. Let's say that you have a, a crazy uncle that you know can only uh, only has time to look at cat videos. You can send him the 52 second video and see if that uh, floats his boat. <laughs> One reason that the mechanism is compelling is because there's no alternative theory. Right? I mean, when you think about creation, there was an alternative theory to uh, evolution, right? I mean, we have this book, it says how in six days, you know, this is the mechanism of, of, the, of our planet uh, rising and the universe and so forth. There's not really a stasis theory. Uh, that is that there are not really many people who are saying this is why our planet has to stay in the same tiny temperature band forever uh, or to effectively negate the idea that greenhouse gases uh, are absorbing infrared light that is being radiated off the Earth. And we have this sort of asymmetry of light that causes this basically leaky one-way valve. And so there really isn't an alternative mechanism. So once you know the mechanism, it's not like deniers can come up with this other one that, that effectively combats it. So let's say you're a denier and you're trying to minimize the, the danger of greenhouse gases you'll focus on what a small proportion of our atmosphere is actually comprised of greenhouse gases. Uh, but that's sort of missing the point because when you're looking at a tall column of air that goes miles and miles into space, uh, you don't need that many of them uh, to capture a, an individual photon. And that's why nine out of 10 of them don't uh, get shot off into space. I call that one-tenth the Goldilocks tithing uh, you know, the sort of uh, relating to the biblical notion that we need to give back 10% of our photons to space because if that 10% window narrows more toward 9%, then we're going to get too hot. And so I think what you can do is you can negate the people uh, who are saying that uh, the amount of greenhouse gases is so small that we, we shouldn't worry about that because you could say, oh, do you feel that way about arsenic also? You know, would you, would you drink something that has th that number of of arsenic molecules <laughs> mixed in water. And uh, I'm not sure if that would be a danger with arsenic, but I'll bet it would be. And even if not, you could find something like plutonium that wouldn't would definitely be the case. So for each particular element that a denier can, comes up with, there can be a targeted response to that. And that's one of the things we're sort of moving toward in our website, howglobalwarmingworks.org. We're trying to develop uh, some FAQs uh, slowly that will, uh, so people can click on it and say, well, if you think it's the solar cycles that account for global warming, click here. And I think that's one of the difficulties that you don't want to like introduce misconceptions uh, to people that, but if they already hold them, then you can address them. Because what we know from memory research is that you, you don't want to like tell people things that are wrong because, uh, you know, five years later, who knows if they're going to remember, you know, uh, one thing or the other. So like the more often people say that Obama is not a Muslim, more often they're associating Muslim and Obama. And so in 10 years, who knows if they'll think, yeah, Obama, he was our first Muslim president, right? You know, what we want is to uh, have a set of representatives in our governments that cannot deny global warming. That is that even in the United States, as wild and woolly as it is, you can't find a single representative or senator 
who says that the earth is flat. They would be laughed off the stage in any debate and they'd lose the election. But we do, in fact, uh, have uh, representatives and senators that will claim that global warming is, is a hoax. So what we need is the population in perhaps even a grassroots way to understand so much about global warming that they realize that someone who would assert that in a debate is a crackpot and they won't be elected. And then, you know, we can move more toward the questions of, well, how dangerous it is it? How fast is it happening? And what can we do about it? And how much are we willing to spend to, to change that? So one of the subtle things that we found in one of our studies was that we were trying very hard, and this was in a, an 11th grade chemistry classroom, you know, in the middle of the way through high school, kind of. We were giving them a little bit of a curriculum that mostly worked, but there was one way in which we uh, weren't as effective as we might have been. That is that uh, it was almost statistically significant that some of the students thought that global warming was natural. And the reason is that they were employing kind of a, a broken syllogism because we told them that the greenhouse effect is natural, and indeed it's been around for, for uh, uh, many, many millions of years, and perhaps a billion or more, uh, and that, uh, but that uh, the, gr the global warming is an unnatural addition to that greenhouse effect. That is, there was a gr this amount of greenhouse effect that was predating human evolution, but we've been adding this much, and therefore it's too much. But they, uh, in the end, some of them remembered that, that uh, the greenhouse effect was natural, and they knew that uh, global warming was an extra greenhouse effect, so they inferred that it also is natural. So you have to be very careful with the way you uh, discuss it, and, uh, and I think that's one of the nice things about uh, research, is you can find out things that are just close enough to, uh, to being cognitively similar that people can make incorrect inferences about them. Yeah, so uh, I guess one of the reasons we termed it wisdom deficit is because I think knowledge deficit is, um, it's got some negative connotations. Uh, for one thing, in the realm of education, it's often uh, uh, got even more uh, negative connotations than probably in climate science. But I think the the difference is that wisdom, I think, should actually be about practical knowledge and the utility of that knowledge, not just information. And so I think the knowledge deficit sort of suggests that people just don't know enough, which is certainly part of the lack of wisdom, but also it's the sense of like uh, how that knowledge is actionable. So for instance, in real life, we might know a lot of things, but they don't make sense. They're not coherently pieced together and we wouldn't know necessarily how to act on them. Whereas uh, I think if you understand enough about uh, climate change, then you can actually uh, move legislators and rulers into action, and you can think about what particularly would be useful for you to do, rather than more sort of inert knowledge or information that one might regurgitate. <coughs> so for instance, in misinformation, often uh, what people are given are, say, uh, statistics that might be misleading or information that's cherry-picked uh, in such a way that sort of suggests that the, the truth of the matter is somewhat different than it really is in terms of the science. And I think part of the, the wisdom one, one needs is to be able to analyze those sorts of bits of agnotology or misinformation and say, oh, so they chose April of this particular year because it's the only month that there is more uh, sea ice you know, in 19, you know, 99 than there was in 1940 or something like that. So I think the wisdom is also uh, part of critical reasoning in that it allows you to disconfirm uh, things that, that may not be accurate by knowing how to poke them. Sometimes it's by reasoning to extremes and say, well, by that measure, we would all be covered in ice right now. Or by that measure, you know, we'd all be, uh, uh, you know, there'd be a beach on the Arctic. So it, it's sort of that kind of BS detection in some respects. We have uh, found a particular niche in our, uh, in our group to, uh, in, with respect to closing the wisdom deficit. So we've we come up with two different ways we think is, uh, is probably useful, uh, perhaps most useful in terms of bang per buck. 
So for instance, it turns out in our research that basically 0% of people know the mechanism of global warming. That if, is if you ask them uh, what's the physical chemical mechanism by which the Earth is purportedly heating up, uh, people draw a blank. Uh, they may be able to recognize parts of it, but they're really not good at, uh, at generating it. So one of the things we thought we'd do is just explain what the mechanism is, and so we've done that. And now we have some video, videos on our uh, website, which is howglobalwarmingworks.org. And uh, so people can very quickly sort of get a sense of uh, how it is that climate scientists would explain uh, why the Earth is warming up. So that's one uh, way that I think you can um, help people's wisdom, you know, reduce that deficit is by uh, using a, a proper understanding of the mechanism as sort of a tiebreaker. The other thing that we've done is we've used some statistics, uh, in this case we call them our seven representative statistics, uh, sometimes <laughs> informally we've called them the saintly statistics, but generally they're statistics that are meant to indicate relatively quickly to people um, some of the effects of global warming that really seem quite um, apt and salient. And the third thing we've been working on lately are, are just sort of uh, graphs that show that uh, the temperature of the Earth has been increasing. So what I've got here are uh, two graphs, and one of them is the Dow Jones Industrial Average adjusted for inflation, and the other one is the Earth's surface temperature according to data that we got from NASA. And what we've done is we've uh, averaged them to take out sort of the, uh, you know, sawtooth kind of nature of them. So you're looking at 16-year averages. Each datum uh, aggregates for 16 years. And so I've asked, asked the three people in the room who were interviewing me which one they think is the Dow Jones Industrial Average and which one is the temperature. Right, well it turns out that the top one actually is temperature. But uh, one thing I should point out is that I asked this of uh, 35 participants who are really quite financially sophisticated mm -hmm. and uh, only 16 out of the 35 chose the correct uh, one. So it was uh, non-significantly less than zero. So the notion is like if you look at these and they're clearly going up, like we ask people, do you think these graphs are going up or going down, are they flat? They look at me like, duh, <laughs> of course they're going up. And then I say, well, one of these is the temperature graph and one of them is Dow Jones. I mean, at that point, how many people could deny that the temperature is going up, right? So that's why we think this is a good chance for being a, the third leg of our tripod in addition to the mechanism and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the seven statistics. And, you know, we, uh, we're hoping that, you know, this is compelling to folks. It does show a little bit of a plateau. But actually, if you look at uh, the graphs more closely and do a moving average, you can, it's a little easier to tell because there's actually like this little almost sine wave looking thing that indicates uh, when the stock market yeah. took quite a tumble, which is really around 1965 to 1981 or so. So uh, you don't always win in the stock market, as it turns out, when you adjust for inflation. But uh, the, uh, the Actually, it turns out that if you do a 60-year moving average of the temperature, then it is completely monotonic. It goes up, you know, every successive average year it goes higher and higher and higher. It, you know, just looks like a jet plane taking off, basically. Whereas in a 16-year moving average, as we have there, then I think every year from 1974 on is monotonic, so that every sub successive averaged year is higher than the one before it, which I think is pretty compelling. So I think all three of those, I sort of describe it as our tripod of, uh, of uh, interventions that help people uh, understand what's going on with, with uh, global warming. And I think that those three legs of the tripod are pretty good at helping folks uh, gain enough wisdom to overcome you know, the sort of misinformation or agnotology that they may be getting from other sources. We found uh, zero polarization, <laughs> and by that I should sort of describe what we mean by polarization. So it turns out that many people use it sort of informally uh, in, in the way that, uh, like in the United States, Democrats and Republicans kind of assort where uh, Democrats find uh, global warming both more plausible and more scary. They have greater concern than Republicans. So that at minimal level of, of asymmetry among uh, liberals and conservatives, that, that's pretty clear. 
Uh, then there's another sort of level of polarization where, by which you might um, generate an, an intervention for someone and you find slightly differential effects between uh, liberals and conservatives, but they're both uh, changed in the direction that one would, would expect. So with our mechanisms, you know, we'd expect both liberals and conservatives to increase their acceptance of global warming, uh, which they do. <laughs> uh, the, the third level of polarization, which is sometimes purported to occur in social psychological situations, is when uh, it's an, some information sort of differentially affects liberals and conservatives, where you find perhaps uh, liberals being more compelled by some of our information, but conservatives less compelled. In fact, so much less compelled that they actually have this sort of propaganda uh, sort of sensation uh, that they're being uh, gamed somehow, and somehow they're being, uh, being worked over. And so purportedly, you know, if they were polarized at that level, then they'd accept global warming even less than they did before you even gave them the information. And we don't find that. We find that our information, both in terms of the mechanism and with our uh, seven representative statistics, increases the acceptance of both liberals and conservatives. So we don't find polarization in that more classical sense that was sort of spawned by work by Lord Ross and Lepper. Although, frankly, they didn't find polarization quite the way they, uh, it's been uh, recast over the years. One of the things they did, for instance, in that paper was they excluded all the middle people. And they just looked at folks at the extremes. Uh -huh. And so they, they found that, uh, indeed, uh, you know, I believe it was a death penalty case. They did find that when you gave pe people information that, that uh, the folks kind of had a sense that there was, you know, a bit of propaganda in it, which was true. I mean, they basically jury-rigged their interventions to some degree. It was relatively light on evidence. And it was also clearly written in a, well, kind of a rhetorical way as a newspaper article, but with a bent, you know. And people can tell when they're reading something, you know, this from Fox News versus CBS or CNN or something like that. And, and, uh, but they never actually tested to see if the people in the middle uh, were polarized. And in fact, a past graduate student did his dissertation with me, and he uh, basically ran a similar experiment, even with death penalty. And we didn't find polarization either when we gave them, for instance, statistics or other information about the death penalty. And so I think polarization is actually rather rare, even for people in that tradition of Lord, Lord Ross and Lepper. And we also make it very clear to our participants that we're really giving them honest information, that there are no deceptions involved, that we say, look, you know, you can share these statistics with your family tonight, you can go home and tell your kids about this mechanism, you know, and, and there are no deceptions involved. And so I think that's part of it. Whereas, you know, in the classical social psychological experiment, you know, if you've got a 19-year-old psych major, they have a sense that, you know, what you're getting might not be the God's honest truth, as they say. We've, we're finding that conservatives are compelled by it as well. Mm -hmm. Now, I imagine that there's some, some limit to that. Like, if we just looked at the very tail of the, the distribution, like people that are employed by uh, a fossil fuel company and are m married to a Republican senator <laughs> or something like that, it's going to be harder and harder. And uh, I forget the particular source in the 30s said something like, it's very hard to get someone to believe something or get very hard for, to get someone to understand something when their salary depends on them not understanding it. Um, but generally, we find uh, a great deal of receptivity uh, and relatively few people that, uh, you know, we get comments from that are, are denying it. Uh, in fact, we get more criticism actually from people who accept global warming, but want us to tweak just the particular way we, we deal with the, uh, the physics involved uh, to, uh, you know, the, into a way that might be more palatable for their background and, and such. So we've been uh, pretty fortunate in terms of the response. And the other thing I might say regarding, uh, you know, convincing people is that it doesn't even matter that much to us if people uh, go to our site and don't remember that specific uh, set of, uh, of constraints regarding the uh, nature of the mechanism of global warming. And the, what, what I liken it to is when people are talking about or thinking about the Pythagorean theorem. You know, if I asked you to right now to, to prove the Pythagorean theorem, uh, if you're like me, it'll take you a little while. <laughs> But there was this one crystal moment, undoubtedly, in your background when you were in geometry or a course like that, and you saw this proof, maybe multiple proofs, and they were elegant and you understood them. And in that beautiful moment, 
you, you became a believer in the Pythagorean theorem in a way that even though you can't uh, regenerate it at a, at a moment's notice, it's part of you. And we hope that that's what the effect will be about our mechanisms and our, our statistics is that even, you know, a month later or a year later when people ask uh, them, you know, in a bar, so what is that mechanism? They'll say, well, you know, I can't remember exactly, but it, it involved infrared light. And, you know, if you look at the video, you'll know. And that's what we're hoping. And, and so part of our desire is just to get 7 billion people to come to our website. And uh, they don't even have to come back as long as they leave and they accept global warming, uh, presuming that that belief is warranted. And we're not so concerned that, you know, on a post-test a year later, they'd get 100% correct on the subtleties about whether or not uh, greenhouse gases are the asymmetrical ones or the symmetrical molecules. So I guess the, uh, what we've done is we've sort of uh, projected onto uh, one particular uh, uh, person who's written in the literature suggesting that uh, people aren't likely to change based upon information, whether it's scientific information or, or whatnot. And I think that that just can't be true. I mean, historically, it, uh, it seems quite unlikely given that people used to think that the Earth was flat, uh, or that uh, the sun revolved around the earth, or that the smoking uh, tobacco was benign for you. So it does indeed seem uh, that over time, you know, societies uh, eventually approximate toward information that is scientifically more normative. Uh, but I also think that it's uh, an unfortunate uh, political move in some respects to suggest that well, there's not much we can do on the front of changing people's minds via information uh, because sometimes the suggestion is, well, you just have to change their culture or wait for the culture to change, which would be terribly long and certainly wasn't necessary for some of these other changes, uh, at least not in a dramatic way. And so I think that in some respects, the idea that people can't change, which is sort of the kernel of, of stasis, uh, contrasts with uh, a whole bunch of data we have now that indicates that people do change when you give them um, the mechanism or the seven statistics and I'll warrant uh, that they'll change even if they see two functions that are going up and you're, they're told the one is the temperature of, uh, of the earth and the other one is the Dow Jones and they can't tell which is which and they believe that the Dow Jones is going up sort of uh, by inference they'd have to accept it. So I think that uh, the problem that the stasis theorists, and I think that by that I include a whole host of just plain folks who say, oh, people won't change, you know, they just believe what they want to believe, which is generally not true. I think humans generally are really quite good at being empiricists. And, uh, you know, one uh, sort of ribald example I have is that, you know, if you were to come home and find your partner in bed with someone else, uh, you could go, you know, feel fully rationalistic and not believe the data. You could say, well, you know, for all I know, I'm sleeping and this is a dream, or I'm hallucinating, or maybe I'm just a brain in a vat. Um, maybe the mail carrier came here to change a light bulb and through some odd chance they just ended up in this situation, <laughs> you know. No, most likely you're going to accept it as a, as a datum that really changes your understanding about the fidelity of your partner. And so I think we tend to be empiricists when you, when you, you come down to it. And the other thing that I think is uh, unfortunate is the sort of suggestion that there's an either-or uh, relationship. That is, that either people are compelled by science information or they're compelled by their culture, when clearly it's, it's both of those. I mean, it's, it's sort of like the, uh, the quote-unquote nature-nurture de debate. And the nature-nurture debate, I think, is clearly uh, you know, uh, you know, obviated as well when you think about the extreme conditions of like a baby Einstein um, sort of raised in a closet, you know, that child wouldn't be the Einstein that, that uh, the, the world came to know. Or similarly, if you have a really severely brain damaged child, no matter what sort of tutoring you could give that child with today's technology and pedagogy, they're never going to master, you know, the, uh, the upper echelons of quantum mechanics or things like that. So I think really we're all, if you, if you really, you know, press people, I think most of them will agree that uh, science information and culture are important. And I wouldn't uh, denigrate the uh, important role of culture. In fact, I even have a little theory that, uh, that takes culture very much at the heart of it. 
about why uh, Americans in particular, but some other cultures don't accept global warming. Uh, so it's not like I think that uh, information is going to be the only thing, but I think in the end it will be the thing that changes people's minds. Yeah, this actually grew out of a line of research that uh, we've called uh, numerically driven inferencing. And uh, what we found is that often a single number can change one's perception of uh, an entire uh, configuration of, of other beliefs regarding a particular realm. So some of the most striking numbers that we've used in the United States are the abortion rate uh, or the legal immigration rate. And uh, people are often, you know, an order of magnitude off, sometimes orders, multiple orders of magnitude off in their estimation of how often it is that a woman will uh, engage in a surgical abortion. Um, or uh, the, uh, the uh, legal immigration rate when you put it in terms of like the current population of the United States. Um, and so people are off by so much, sometimes, uh, you know, like 300,000 off. <laughs> so, and, and we're not talking about, you know, uh, bumpkins. I mean, some of my colleagues in um, mathematics cognition uh, or, or mathematical education are, uh, you know, have the most bizarre, bizarrely uh, distant uh, answers from the truth, uh, from the fact of the matter. And so when people uh, see that the, the contrast between what they anticipate and what they see is evidentially true when we give them the actual number, uh, it causes them to have this cascade of inferences and they very quickly change their understanding uh, about the realm, whether it's abortion or, or uh, immigration. To give you an example from, uh, from the abortion debate, uh, one of the things that we ask is uh, for every one million babies that are born, how many legal abortions take place? in that period of time. So in basically, in, in the time it takes for um, a million babies to pop out of mothers, uh, how many legal abortions take place. And uh, so it turns out that some people just say one. There's like one abortion for every one million live births. Um, and, but the median estimate usually comes in around uh, five or 10,000. Uh, but the actual number uh, is roughly almost 300,000. So you, you're surprised right there. So what happens is people have to accommodate, you know, in their sort of mental structure, how they could think it was one or 5,000 or 10,000. And on average, you know, it's, it's about uh, 60 times higher than people anticipate. And uh, so for any given realm, generally I think that within like five numbers, you can kind of get a sense of what's going on in that particular issue parametrically. Um, so for instance, the abortion uh, number often causes people to think, wow, uh, Americans just aren't uh, responsible enough with their, with their birth control. Uh, but indeed, it, uh, it, uh, it turns out that birth control isn't perfect, right? So I think 5% of uh, women on, uh, on the pill still get pregnant in a, in a given year. In the end, it turns out that almost one out of every two pregnancies uh, is not planned for, and then almost one out of two pregnancies that's not planned for uh, gets aborted. So that kind of gives you a sense of what I believe is going on with our statistics for global warming as well. So one of our statistics is the uh, increase in methane, you know, which is a pretty dangerous greenhouse gas since the dawn of the industrial age to today. Well, let's say that you're dealing with someone who denies global warming and they'll say, well, gee, you know, I think that if anything, uh, methane has probably gone up like 2%, but I'll bet it's actually gone down 5%. So what would, what would they do uh, if you told them, uh, well, actually, it turns out it's increased over 150%. We're getting near tripling the amount of methane that we had in the year 1750. Well, it's hard for them to uh, accommodate that uh, if they truly do believe that methane is a, is a greenhouse gas and that gases are somehow involved. It sort of kicks out that, uh, that potential leg that, that suggests that, well, maybe global warming is occurring, but it's negligible. It's what I call the parameterization problem that, you know, yeah, it's happening, but the Earth is so vast, our Gaia can absorb any amount of greenhouse gases it needs. You know, it'll be sunk into the ocean or somehow, you know, the Earth will self-right itself at an appropriate level. If you think that uh, methane is only going up by 2% and you find out it's getting near tripling, then you have to sort of reconfigure uh, your understanding of the situation. Similarly, if you think that, you know, the uh, Earth's ice has been relatively stable and you find out that it's 
dramatically dropping, uh, then then it can be, uh, you know, uh, it can violate your homeostasis and cause you to go through sort of a Piagetian uh, uh, accommodation rather than assimilation. You have to go through a, like conceptual change. So that we're not talking about small incremental cognitive changes, but rather a, a recentering, a restructuring in sort of like gestalt psychological terms. We found empirically in, uh, in study after study that uh, the greater the distance between what you would predict a number to be and the feedback number, the more you are likely to change um, in terms of your, um, your concepts about that and also your preferences. So usually what we do is we look at like policies like what you would prefer a number to be uh, divided by what you understand the number to be. And so like you might think that if things are okay, that ratio is one because uh, you're sort of status quo. But if what you find out uh, uh, to be true is vastly different than what you think it ought to be, then people will actually change their policy. They'll think that something that was just fine should be increased or decreased or, or, or uh, vice versa, that something they thought really needed to be changed is just fine. So we find that in the abortion debate, people end up caring a lot more about abortion after we give them our, our surprising statistic. Whereas in immigration, people care a lot less because uh, that number is, is, uh, is um, the opposite of alarming. <laughs> uh, not necessarily that it should be, but that's the way it's in interpreted. So uh, definitely we find that uh, the greater the distance between what one expects a number to be and, and what it turns out to be, and then you might imagine, because like one of the most benign numbers we ask is uh, how much sleep does someone get during a day? And you know, it turns out it's like 6.9 hours in the United States, and the most common guess is seven hours. So those 0.1 hours isn't going to dramatically change what you think about in terms of like when we should turn the TV off or stop looking at screens and get better sleep. Um, so the magnitude of how far you're off really does matter unless it's something that you think you have no uh, clue about anyway, like how far we are from Pluto at this very moment. You know, if it's a hundred million or 20 billion for a lot of people, that's basically, I uh, know, that's, I couldn't tell, <laughs> you know. <laughs> One thing that actually a number of Americans find uh, compelling is we, we say in 1850, there were approximately 150 glaciers in our Glacier National Park. Now there are this many, and it turns out there are only 25. So people have that sense like, wow, you know, five, six of all the glaciers in the park that's named after glaciers, you know, that they can tell pretty soon it's going to be glacierless national park. And, you know, there's a sense of regret and sadness that, uh, that you know, we're hoping, you know, will at least cause people to think about, uh, you know, changing things so that that, that doesn't happen or uh, is retarded. The misleading statistics are ones that you would have found uh, in fossil fuel websites. In fact, some of them were actually uh, uh, inspired by Mobile's uh, website when it was denying climate change. Uh, when one of my first doctoral students was working on uh, environmental cognition, uh, he found this mobile website that was basically trying to fill the viewers' minds with uh, misleading uh, information. So, for instance, one of the elements were, uh, uh, did you know that, uh, that uh, they, they would have you believe that water is a greenhouse gas? Uh, how could water be bad for you, you know? <laughs> and of course, the, the truth of the matter is uh, that uh, even water is, is uh, you know, is, is, uh, although it's, it's fine in, in some numbers, too much water is bad for you. So you can actually die by drinking too much water. Uh, let alone if a thousand pound block of ice fell on your head. <laughs> so it kind of depends, you know, it's like aspirin, you know, one, one aspirin is fine, but a bottle of it is not. And so again, the parameterization is important. One of the, the classic cherry-picked numbers was pointing out that there was a, a relatively uh, plateauish period from 1940 to 1975 <clears throat> in terms of the Earth's uh, uh, mean surface temperature. And I'm still not 100% sure why that appears to be the case, whether it's uh, that we weren't getting great data from uh, parts of the planet where we don't have probes, like uh, the Arctic, Antarctic, and parts of Africa, or if it's because we're not putting probes down in the Marianas Trench, you know, like uh, deep ocean and so forth. But for one reason or another, there is uh, this apparent 
um, plateau from 1940-1975 given the ex extant data. And so uh, one of the things we do is we cherry pick numbers there and we actually find two points where the uh, temperature of the Earth seems like it's dropped minus two, minus two degrees, sorry, minus 0.2 degrees Fahrenheit. And of course that's an extre extremely tiny amount, especially when you think of temperature in the Kelvin scale. You know, you're talking about a one, you know, a 0.2 out of 600-ish. Uh, and so, uh, but those sorts of things I think can be compelling and indeed when we combined, uh, when we collated eight statistics of this uh, sort of uh, uh, evil or misleading non-representative set, uh, we found that it was, uh, it was indeed uh, uh, enough to cause people to doubt uh, global warming is occurring. And uh, in fact, uh, it really uh, uh, decreased people's, uh, their confidence about their knowledge about global warming. So um, by using these cherry-picked statistics, I think that those folks that are trying to uh, cause, uh, uh, you know, some uh, confusion about global warming, they can be successful uh, because uh, in a relatively small number of uh, statistics, we found that we could diminish uh, our participants' uh, confidence by about 50 percent. So it's really quite striking. And I think that's sort of like the, oh, there's my partner in, in bed with the, uh, with the mail carrier kind of thing. It's like, wow, I thought this was all true, and now I'm seeing these things that suggest otherwise. We didn't find as much of a uh, uh, confidence change in the representative statistics, but it's partly because even people who accept uh, that climate change is happening uh, are still surprised at how evident it is in terms of the effects. So I think there's kind of a potential asymmetry there um, where, um, you know, even if you're surprised by statistics that suggest global warming is occurring, uh, that's going to ch change your confidence a little bit. So any surprise is going to drop your confidence in what you understand. So if I told you that actually the average American gets 1.6 hours of sleep, that should probably really change your confidence in your understanding about sleep, right? Well, how could that be true? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sleeping way too much. <laughs> or what are they doing? You know, what are they putting in their Red Bull over there? So I think, um, and you know, you'd probably have to get a reasonably random sample of, uh, of saintly or uh, evil statistics to really tell if they're kind of comparable in their effect. But, but you might imagine that the people who are going to be most changed are those that. Uh, have completely drunk the Kool-Aid, as we say, that either they totally accept global warming and you give them these uh, misleading statistics, or the people that think that there's zero chance that the Earth is even warming, or has ever warmed, and you show them the, these statistics. So there's much more room for people to, to move, of course, if you're not dealing with a ceiling effect or a floor effect. It's not hard to find misleading statistics of that sort. In fact, it was much easier, easy, f easier for us to find misleading statistics than the saintly statistics, partly because I don't think that, the, that climatologists have done a good enough job at uh, generating a message that is short and concise that would include like these statistics or the mechanism or our graphs. That's why I think the mechanism is so important because when people are like uh, yelling at each other, whether it's uh, through appeals to authority, like in the United States, you might have Rush Limbaugh claiming that, that this is a joke, or Senator Inhofe from Oklahoma is a hoax, and then you might have like Rachel Maddow <laughs> or other people uh, from the media who are saying, well, obviously, uh, you know, the planet is heating up. Uh, you know, if you really don't have much of a sense of the science, then you're sort of caught between these two, two different authorities. And I think that's where mechanism is most critical as a tiebreaker, because once you can see how we must be heating up by putting more and more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, I think that allows people to navigate between them. One of the uh, contrasts that I, uh, I uh, engage in with respect to this is that I'll say, let's say that you went to, and this isn't a terribly politically correct example, but let's say that you went to a group of people, say, in the far reaches of the Amazon in like 1960 or something like that. And uh, this is a group of people who had never seen Western technology. 
and you try to explain to them, look, we have these things called toilets, you know, and they're really cool, and you know, they'll take your waste away. And so maybe um, it sounds plausible to some of them, but the spiritual leader of the group says, don't believe him, he's lying to you. They just want to get better you know, trade, you know, sort of terms for our pelts. Uh, so what would you do in that case? You know, here, uh, let's say you're a member of the tribe, here's this foreigner who has these interesting things, and, but here's your spiritual leader, they're saying it's true, it doesn't true, it's not true. So one thing that one might do as, a, uh, as an explorer is to go to a riverbank, you know, and take a stick and draw into the mud, well, this is what a toilet looks like. So we have this tank of water up here, we have a bowl of water down here, we've got pipes, water comes in here, water leaves there with the naughty bits, <laughs> the, not the, the, uh, the, the less than pleasant stuff. And so then, you know, if you're a tribes person, you might think, well, you know, that actually sounds plausible. I could see how that would work. And if you still don't believe it, you know, the, uh, maybe the, the explorer can call that down to Recife and have someone, you know, hike up this little model of a toilet. And we say, look, this is kind of how it works, you know. And so eventually the, that mechanism uh, will cause people to change their minds. And I think that generally in most of the controversies that people discuss, um, you know, uh, or most of the potential controversies in science, mechanism really doesn't matter, right? So if I told you about superconductivity or superfluidity, uh, you know, you might think, well, that sounds okay, because there's no one, you know, on TV who's saying, don't believe those people would have you believe that superconductivity can occur, or superfluidity, or quantum tunneling, or something like that. They're lying to you. Uh, so it's only when there's a dispute that really the, the mechanism comes in a tiebreaker. And then if there were a dispute, you know, then you'd have to say, well, this is exactly how superfluidity works. And you'd have to explain it. And, uh, but it turns out that most people don't know how to explain a whole bunch of things. Like I've asked a number of people lately if they could explain why the Earth is spherical. And many people just like draw a blank, <laughs> you know. And you'd think that's like one of the main tenets we know, right? We know that the Earth is round, you know, it's spherical. And yet, well, why is that the case? Why aren't we a cube? Why aren't we a tetrahedron? What is it that makes us a sphere? And uh, virtually no one I've asked has ever really been asked that question, or asked to account for that knowledge that we take as so central. Well, it's probably a really important question back in the 1600s or 1450s or something like that, right? Um, but now, uh, it's just something we take for granted, and since there's no other side, we don't have to know the mechanism of that. And so it's really only things like evolution and global warming where the mechanism can really come in as a tiebreaker. And that's why I think that our explanation of the mechanism makes it very salient and it makes it what I call round world, round world evident. <laughs>
Uh, so I, I think it's reasonably good. And when I was speaking to a uh, Norwegian uh, oil executive, uh, energy uh, uh, executive, he was saying that we can convert now if we want to, that it's really just the problem of uh, people who are used to making the money don't want to stop that. I mean, if you're Exxon or you're Chevron and you think you have a certain am tri a number of trillions of dollars of, of fossil fuels underground, you are not going to be happy by saying, oh, let's just forget about all that stuff. Those assets actually are, are meaningless. So we're going to just start uh, doing wind power and solar now. So you can imagine the, the motivation for people to not change, especially if uh, they think they have these assets that they want to, uh, to, to reap and they're being uh, told that perhaps that's not such a good idea. So I think that the main thing is that uh, we can fix this. And I think that's really important because some studies have shown, even on this campus by Feinberg and Willer, I think, that if you just tell people about the problems of global warming without uh, suggesting solutions, then people will turn off because they sort of have a learned helplessness response. So yeah, I guess in my elevator pitch, I'd say people should really learn the mechanism and the data, whether it's the statistics or the graphs, and that we can fix this and we should fix it. And if we really care about our kids, and our grandkids, or even if you don't have kids, if you care about mountains or, or fish or, or trees or, or even sort of a sense of aesthetics, uh, we should change this. And that every person should look into their future and think about, you know, when they're near the end of their life, when they're 90, are they going to look back and feel uh, badly that they didn't do more when they could have? And so that's what motivates me. I'd, I want to do stuff now so that I'm not you know, near my deathbed and saying, oh, you know, if I just done a little bit more of that or something anyway. Well, I've always been interested in uh, sort of uh, cognition about science. Even when I was an undergraduate, I was uh, interviewing physicists about uh, various physical phenomena. And uh, I have an undergraduate major in microbiology. My first uh, publications were actually in applied physics and uh, cryogenics and, and such. And uh, so I, I took a lot of chemistry and physics and biology. And so I'm very much a scientist, even more than I am a uh, cognitive scientist or a psychologist. I, I uh, love the methodology and the, uh, the, uh, the justifications and epistemology of, of science. So I've sort of been looking at scientific reasoning in a number of ways, especially explanatory coherence, how people come to to grips with uh, a large configuration of evidence and hypotheses and competitions between bits of theory and such. And that's what you have even in the abortion debate or in uh, the uh, immigration debate. Basically, you've got this large complex of competing hypotheses with evidence. And also, I've been interested in uh, how people deal with numbers. And uh, I've actually uh, taught here on campus to journalists trying to get them to to use numbers in a better way and uh, doing better analytics. So um, the particular hook into global warming was actually from evolution when I started to ponder why it is that Americans among uh, most peer nations were least likely to accept uh, evolution. And I realized that a lot of that had to do with sort of religious and uh, religiousness and nationalism. And then I found, you know, empirically that uh, there's a, a positive correlation between people who accept evolution and global warming. And, uh, you know, that uh, that made me think, well, maybe, you know, some of the same analysis should be applied to global warming. And that's one of the reasons why I started looking at it. And, and it's more interesting to me in terms of, uh, of science cognition than evolution because, you know, for say the average farmer, maybe in Kansas or something like that, it really doesn't matter so much if you accept evolution. I mean, it could be that you deny it, but you can still raise hogs and cattle and corn. In fact, you might even be using genetically modified corn that's based on evolutionary theory that, that you're denying, but it's not going to change too much. I mean, uh, there really isn't a, a huge downside for people ignoring evolution. But <clears throat> if people ignore and deny global warming, then that's going to have really bad effects for future generations of humans and other species. And so it, it seems to me that uh, that's why it's perhaps the world's biggest problem. And since I study problem solving, I figure I might as well be working on uh, one of the bigger ones than rather trivial ones. My final question is, 
how often have your ears bled to you listening and reading so much on this topic? <laughs> <laughs> that was a phrase I used. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, I think in particular, uh, when our ears were most close to bleeding was when we were developing the 400 words that explain the mechanism. And uh, I use that phrase often with respect to that because what we would do is, uh, well, first, whenever I engage in a new analysis of, uh, an, of a controversy, whether it's a abortion or immigration or evolution, I like to write down and write like two relatively short essays about why they're it's happening or it's not happening or it's good or it's not acceptable. And in this case, I found out that I really couldn't explain the mechanism of global warming to my satisfaction. And I realized I'd probably only get like a B plus. I would be in the zero of 270 uh, San Diegans that we interviewed because I, I wouldn't have gotten, you know, even a, a good basic 35 word explanation. So one of the things that I found out when I was trying to lay out for myself the mechanism of global warming that is that I would have been one of those 270 San Diegans that didn't really know it at a sufficient level, at the 35 word level that I would have caused, uh, called even basic. And so uh, I did a little bit of research and then I wrote the rest of the explanation, including the asymmetry between visible and infrared light. And I thought, wow, I wonder how many people would know this. And so I asked around and then I thought, well, I should write this up for others. And so we actually went to a uh, uh, physical chemist here on campus named Ron Cohen, Ronald Cohen. He's an excellent atmospheric chemist. And uh, we were involved in a grant proposal a while, so I knew him. And so I said, Ron, how does this read? And, uh, you know, like you might expect from a lot of climate scientists, oh, well, I don't know, this has got to change, you know. And I said, oh, okay, so I'm taking notes, I'm taking notes. And then I, uh, I go back and I, I change it. And so I uh, tried to put it into just plain people's talk, you know, and I brought it back to him. And he said, oh, well, I don't know, you got to choose it. And I said, oh, okay, okay. So I went back and changed it. And I did this in collaboration with uh, a couple other people, Lloyd Goldwasser and Daniel Reinholz. And so finally I went back to, to Ron and I said, well, what about now? And he said, yeah, that's basically it. And I think what's interesting is that most climate scientists can't uh, find the sort of simple elements in explaining global warming. And it's sort of like the uh, paradox of the expert that we often find in cognition. That is, you know, that I, I was a much better instructor of skiing when I was a relative novice because I could remember what it was like for me not to know which way is downhill, <laughs> you know. And so it's harder and harder sometimes to explain simple mechanisms when you've got more fancy ways of talking about it. So like if you look at our 400 words, you won't find a phrase like radiative forcing. Or you won't even find albedo because, you know, studies of, uh, of cognition like psycholinguistics indicate that as much as 50% of the processing time of a sentence can, uh, the variance of that can be swallowed up by using novel words. So I figure better to use relatively simple words that people can get through and understand and really glom onto than write a and then try to, you know, show how fancy one is by using these, uh, as we used to say, 50 cent words. So I think that was really one of the ways in which uh, we were working so hard our ears bled because we were trying to find a way that would be succinct and uh, interpretable. And in fact, in our 400 words, we have a summary and a shorter summary. So the actual, you know, uh, main content that is not summarized is probably closer to like 200 words and uh, 300 words. And so you can really get a, uh, a sense of it in that. And, and I think that's a difficulty. That is many people, if you were to ask a, a geneticist or a molecular biologist or someone else to explain evolution, you know, you'd hear a lot of fancy words. And so I think that one of the uh, things that you want to get across to the public is a way in which they can understand it. Because, you know, you're really trying to inform, not so much try to, you know, dazzle them. And uh, often, you know, the, the most eloquent, elegant uh, things that you can portray can be gotten ac across with relatively simple language, unless, you know, uh, the concepts really warrant more. Well, <laughs> it's uh, robust enough so far, anyway. At least, uh, yeah. But you never know the uh, 
if, uh, if uh, we get too political, you know, there might be a problem with the people who've been hacking Sony and whatnot. <laughs>